Recognized as the greatest rally raid in the world and one of the biggest motorsports events on the planet, the Dakar is more than just a race and represents the ultimate human and sporting adventure. Taking place over a period of 10 to 15 days each year through several thousand kilometers of some of the most difficult, hostile and majestic terrain on the planet, the event brings together both amateur and professional competitors in a test of human endurance and spirit. It's man, machine and nature against each other in an epic challenge where just getting across the finish line is a huge achievement. The history of the Dakar dates back to 1977 when the idea of the adventure began. Motorcycle racer Thierry Sabine found himself lost in the Libyan desert during the Abidjan Nice rally. Safe from the sands, he returned to France still enthralled to this landscape and promising himself he would share his fascination with as many people as possible. He proceeded to come up with a route starting in Europe, continuing to Algiers and crossing Agadez before eventually finishing at Dakar. The founder coined a motto for his inspiration, a challenge for those who go, a dream for those who stay behind. Courtesy of his great conviction, and that modicum of madness peculiar to all great ideas, the dream quickly became a reality. On the 26th of December 1978, 182 vehicles turned up in the Place du Trocadéro in Paris for a 10,000 km journey into the unknown for the inaugural race. Among the 74 trailblazers who made it to the Senegalese capital, Cyril Neveu, at the handlebars of a Yamaha 500 XT, wrote the opening entry on the honors list of the greatest rally in the world. Since then, the race has continued to adapt and evolve, going beyond what's been done before, winning over the public with stories of ordinary adventurers defying the wilderness with limited resources. Sadly, in 1986, the race lost its founder and inspiration, Thierry Sabine, who died as he lived chasing adventure in the Sahara Desert. During the running of that year's race, his helicopter crashed into dunes during a sandstorm whilst out searching for vehicles. His legacy lived on, however, and the race that he inspired has grown into the biggest annual rally raid event in the world. A race that has taken place every year since its inception, except for 2008, when it was cancelled due to security concerns. With each year's edition of the race, new pages have been written into the history of this remarkable event with each telling a story of extraordinary feats of human endeavor and featuring some names in legend. Names such as Stéphane Pétrancel, who has won the race an incredible 13 times with victories in both the motorcycle and car classes. Harry Batanen, who won the race in four consecutive years in the cars category from 1987 to 1991. As well as Jutta Kleinschmidt, who in 1998 became the first female to win a stage in Dakar later going on to do even better when in 2001, behind the wheel of a Mitsubishi, she became the first woman to win the overall event. Looking back, it is a history that to date can be divided into three distinct chapters, shaped by the lands through which it has journeyed and the people it has touched. From its early and inspired beginnings journeying out of Europe and into the harsh yet beautiful conditions of the African continent, the race grew in legend and stature, spanning 30 countries and winning over fans and competitors alike, all bound by a spirit of adventure and willingness to journey into the unknown. The success of the event and its growing worldwide popularity, however, also brought with it growing security concerns. This culminated in 2008, when the dark shadow of terrorism cast itself over what would have been the 30th edition of the race, forcing its cancellation that year. However, the spirit of the Dakar, which had its origins on the African continent, was to live on elsewhere. 2009 saw the Dakar rise from the ashes, reborn on the South American continent and lovingly embraced by the millions of loyal and passionate motorsport fans that lived there. It was a chapter that lasted a decade, in which time the race crossed the continent from the Pacific to the Atlantic, spanning Argentina, Chile, Peru, Bolivia and Paraguay. Each year, legions of fans, about 4 million, lined the roads of Dakar to watch competitors battle to the unique and challenging conditions of the South American landscapes. From vast deserts to amazing highlands, salt flats and floods, the land of the people of South America firmly etched their place in the history of the Dakar. 2020 marks the beginning of a new chapter in the Dakar history with the race now shifting to the Middle East. 
The desert sands of Saudi Arabia appear to look like a return to the origins of the Dakar, and it's set to write new tales of this legendary adventure. Although the race takes place over two weeks with one rest day in between, the Dakar actually begins well before the starting podium and represents a huge logistical and technical challenge. One month prior to the event, many of the vehicles competing in Dakar, including those of the race organizers, are shipped together from France to the start in the host country. About a week prior to the start, competitors and organizers arrive in Saudi Arabia. This is followed by what's known as scrutineering. Taking place over two days prior to the event, it involves both an administrative and technical component. The administrative requires all competitors submit to a whole host of regularity obligations, such as checking of licenses and medical forms, whilst the technical part involves the reviewing of competitors' vehicles, such as navigation and safety equipment. The scrutineering phase also enables competitors to make any last-minute adjustments, such as fine-tune the settings, double-check all the nuts and bolts, and finish welding the subframes. Once scrutineering is finished, competitors must attend a big race briefing where they receive important race information. After all this is done, then and only then can competitors finally take their place on the starting podium. It is here, one day before the actual race, that all competitors are presented one by one to a crowd of cheering fans. After all the challenges of just getting to the starting podium, what awaits competitors is the most intense and challenging two weeks of their lives. This is because despite changing places, the central pillar of the Dakar Rally is and always has been endurance. The challenge of overcoming thousands of kilometers of some of the most difficult terrain on the planet and battling the many physical, mental and mechanical challenges along the way is what makes the Dakar so unique. In fact, so difficult is the challenge that it is not uncommon for at least 50% of the field to fail to complete the journey. Another unique thing about Dakar is that everyone can potentially enter. You don't need to be a rally raid champion to take part. In fact, the vast majority of its competitors are amateurs. The only condition is to be at least 18 years of age and possess an FIA or an FIM international license for cars, trucks, bikes and quads. Motorbikes and UTV riders, however, are subject to a selection criterion which requires candidates to have already finished a qualifying rally raid. The openness of Dakar means that each year it attracts a diverse range of competitors spanning the broad spectrum of humanity. Whether they be amateurs, professionals and even celebrities, all share a common desire to compete in the race and are bound by the spirit of Dakar and the brotherhood it brings. In fact, although they are ultimately competing against each other, camaraderie is essential. It is a common feature of the race for competitors to stop and help each other out when encountering difficulty. This camaraderie finds expression each night at the end of each day's racing in the bivouac sites. The bivouac is the place where participants camp for the night and appears to be like a travelling village following the race. There are between 2,500 and 3,000 people in a bivouac, including competitors, mechanics, team staff, rally officials, medical staff and media representatives. Every race day in the Dakar starts and ends at a bivouac and is made up of two different sections known as the Special and the Liaison. The Special stages are the most exciting parts of the Dakar. These are the competitive timed sections, often off-road, across hostile terrain in which competitors try to achieve the fastest time possible while trying desperately not to crash out completely. The time set in the special stage to which are added possible penalties determines the overall positions in the classification standings. Sections before and after the specials are referred to as liaison sections. For safety and security reasons, it is not always possible to begin and end the special stage at the bivouac sites. In this case, race vehicles must proceed from the bivouac site to the special stage start point. Crucial to success in the special stage is navigation, as the Dakar is in essence an orienteering race. Competitors must find their way through, over and around the many obstacles of the course as quickly as possible. However, they must do so in a way that preserves both man and machine. The goal is not to make any navigational mistakes that could result in a crash, penalties, poor performances or getting lost. Speed is important, but not as important as safety and attention to detail. To aid competitors in their quest, they are provided with a roadbook. The roadbook is the key navigation element. It describes all the necessary information to navigate between the many waypoints and checkpoints during each stage. 
The roadbook is provided by the organizers and is distributed every evening at the finish of the stage for the following one. Starting in 2020, the roadbook will be given either the night before or only 15 minutes before the start. It increases the difficulty of navigation. The rally route remains a secret until the delivery of the roadbook to the competitors, but even then the roadbook only provides step-by-step -step instructions and how to navigate the course. An overall map remains elusive. It is only through following the instructions in the roadbook and then validating the checkpoints and waypoints during the race that the overall route of the course is discovered. Competitors will study the roadbook in the short time they have prior to the race to be prepared. The roadbook is divided into three columns and is read from left to right. On the left, the large number is the total numbers of kilometers into the section. The smaller number in the bottom corner is the number of kilometers from one item to the next. Notifications of start and ending of speed control zones as well as checkpoints and waypoints will also appear in this box. In the middle is the tulip, which is a drawing showing the trail, terrain and landmarks at that particular kilometer. You enter each tulip drawing from the bottom of the drawing. On the right is an observation giving more information about that tulip, such as its cap or compass heading the relevant speed for speed control zones and whether or not there is a waypoint marker in that section. The observations use a lexicon of symbols established by race organizers which also must be learnt. So as much as the race is a physical challenge for pilots and co-pilots, it is equally a mental challenge to stay focused, alert and prepared over the two weeks in order to face all difficulties. The roadbook is used in conjunction with other instruments on the vehicle in order for competitors to successfully navigate the special stages of each day's course. Whilst the type of equipment and configuration may differ between vehicles, generally all vehicles will have the following. An ICO or resettable digital odometer and speedometer that keeps track of distance travelled. A compass to provide cap headings. An alert system known as Sentinel that alerts competitors to the presence of other vehicles. A GPS unit supplied by the organizers that gives location data and is set up to guide competitors to waypoints once they reach a certain radius, validating them once reached. And a safety instrument and beacon called an track. Despite the solitude of competing in the Dakar, competitors are never completely alone. During the race, real-time data is transmitted back to the race headquarters located in Paris known as the PCO. This enables to monitor positions and track competitors taking action if there is a potential problem. For instance, if a competitor hasn't moved. The Dakar features five categories of vehicles teamed by one to three competitors, not counting support crew for the larger professional teams. These categories are the motorcycles, cars, quads, trucks and more recently the side-by-side -side or SSV category. Whilst these categories do feature professional teams with backing from large auto constructors who see the Dakar as the ideal testing ground for their vehicles and prototypes, the majority of the field comes from the amateur ranks or privateers. However, whether it be factory cars officially entered by constructors to buggy prototypes assembled in a garage by an enthusiastic amateur, the Dakar has always been for those that compete more than just a race. It is and remains an adventure into the unknown and a journey of self-quest, transforming participants from inside out and thrilling generations of fans for over 40 years.